By 1945, Liang Sichang and his family had been living in Lijuang for five years. Their letters reveal that even after all this time, they were still hopeful about the future. Dearest Wilma, we've just received the exciting telegram from Hall Paxton telling us that you are actually in New Delhi. The reality of such an event is hard to grasp at first, though we had talked of nothing else for these last ten years of your suddenly coming back to us. The children are so grown now that there are now four of the Liangs awaiting your arrival with equal intensity. Dear darling Wilma, a year ago this was D-Day. This year we received news that you will be in Chongqing by the 10th, and the 10th is my birthday. When all this adds up it means one thing. You are coming, and we are in a celebrating mood. Dearest Aunt Wilma, I have got your dear letter. Both Mammy and I were so happy that we nearly shed tears. As you see, I'm learning to typewrite. I'm typing this letter myself instead of writing. This typewriter ribbon is given to us by a man called John Fairbank. Perhaps you know him. He was a very nice man when he was here. Mummy is still pretty and young, but she thinks that she is getting old and ugly. I often argue with her. I am sure that when you come here you will take my side. Wilma Fairbank had been appointed to the culture section of the US Embassy in Chongqing. She arrived in the city in May of 1945. Ten years ago, on Christmas morning 1935, Liang Sichang and Phyllis and Lao Jin were all at the Tianmen station to say goodbye to us as we left China. Last week, on the 3rd of July 1945, Sichang was at the airport to welcome me back, as Lao Jin had already done in Kunming. One evening, not long after she arrived, Wilma Fairbank was chatting with Liang Sichang and two young writers in the doorway of the embassy when something happened. Suddenly he stopped talking. He and the others stiffened into a vigilant tenseness almost like hunting dogs. I had to strain my ears to hear what they had heard. It was the faraway sound of a siren. Could it be an air raid? Preposterous. And yet each of them was alert for the possibility after years of conditioning to the real thing. Could it instead be signalling the victory? News of victory spread across Chongqing like wildfire. Finally, the war had ended. Lin Huayin celebrated by going to a tea house in Li Zhuang. She took a sedan chair with Wilma Fairbank walking alongside. In the five years she had spent in the village, she had never travelled so far before. I went to town again by chair, her present, took a boat punted by two of Tsai Ping's boyfriends, went to a restaurant for noodles, sat in another tea house to get a rest, returned by way of the football field and watched a volleyball match from a tea house on the bank, and so on. I also visited Tsai Ping's school the day before, looking very elegant and caused a sensation. In the times of greatest tribulation, they had read these lines to their children. Now, the same lines celebrated a great victory. News at the Northern Gate. The North has been recaptured. I cannot stop the tears from pouring down my coat. Staring into my wife's face, I can see no trace of grief. 
I pack my books and poems in a fervor like a madman. Though my hair is white, I drink deeply. In the green glow of spring, we are homeward bound. We shall take a boat and pass through the three gorges in a day. And passing through Xiangyang, we'll finally reach Luoyang. In December 1945, Wilma Fairbank arranged for Lin Huiyin to leave Lijuang Village. The two women made their way to Chongqing, where Lin spent most of her time in her hotel room. Occasionally, though, Wilma would take her in a jeep to the cinema or to her son's school or for a meal at the U.S. Embassy. There, Lin Weiyin particularly enjoyed talking with the army officers. On one occasion, she attended a reception for leaders of the Kuomintang and the Communist Party of China. The Liangs are here. Phyllis is out of her room in Lijuang for the first time in five years. She walked into our living room and gasped. It's just like walking into a magazine, for it is only in magazines that she has seen open fires and shaded lights in these last years. Everything is new and exciting to her, and she constantly keeps her eyes peeled for the new dresses and books and paintings and all the sights of this to her great city of Chongqing. Unfortunately, all this doesn't all mean that she is better. I took Dr. Ilosa, the famous chest surgeon, to see her, and he told me that both lungs are involved as well as the kidney. That it is just a matter of a few years, perhaps five, before her brief but vivid life must come to an end. Still, she is full of vivacity and responsive to all facets of life, and will probably be that way to the end. When, I wonder, can I have that? Quietness for just one more time, standing in a spring breeze, facing the mountain across, eyes on the river in between. When I wonder, can I fully appreciate the distance in time and the age of landscape?